We'll read chapter 22. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Ullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard of it, they went down thither to him. And every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became captain over them. For there were with him about 400 men. What a motley crew. Mm -hmm. If anybody had time and room to complain, it would have been David. Because <laughs> you said I was going to be king, and this is what you've given me. Everybody who's in distress, everybody who's in debt, is it like, give me a break here. You have me running from somebody who has got a <coughs> mega army. And this is the provision that you make for my army. It's all about the attitude of how you see it. Yeah. And David went thence to Mizpah and Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know that God, what God will do for me. As we've gone down, verse 6, When Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, I saw a boat in Gabea under a tree in Ramah, having a spear in his hand, and all the servants were standing about him. So there he is, primed, ready for the, the, the hunt David down. As we would read through all of that chapter, um, which we will not do, you can do that on your own leisure, but we see that at the outset, the men that David has to work with, I say, all who were distressed, all who were uh, in debt, and all who were discontented. Right. So you have an unhappy bunch of men who are up to their ears in debt and are anxious and worried. So that's all the men that he has. What can you pick out of what he's got? Mm -hmm. Is that the beginnings of him becoming a good leader? Let's look, what are the positives that you can see in there? Struggling? Can't see it. Well, they needed an army, didn't they? Yep. And God provided them. It may not have been the man of his choice, but we bet it. I think there's other things that we can learn from in there too. <clears throat> that was the starting point. However, let's say that God had provided highly trained and skilled soldiers. Would that have been better? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, yeah. You've got a blank canvas to work with here. Mm -hmm. See, it's sometimes it's harder to undo. It's uh, something that's been instilled in somebody that's wrong. Wrong doctrine is very, very hard to undo. Because, you see, in order to get to your blank canvas stage, it's kind of like, if you give me, say you give me this, this jumper, but I decide that in actual fact, I don't like that jumper. But I like the colour and I like the wool. Mm -hmm. Now, I would have to unpick and unravel all of that before I can start. Once I've unravelled it, then I have to roll up all the wool and then I unwash the wool and then roll it all up and then restart it from scratch. But there's also, there's still going to be crinkles in it. Mm -hmm. However, the person who made that jumper got wool that was pristine, a blank slate. Then they said, this is the pattern that I'm going to make this jumper with. You see, David could look at them and instead of saying, what a motley crew have I got before my eyes here. He thought, blank canvas, no training to untrain. Nothing, what I instill in them will be my way. It is much, much more difficult to train somebody who thinks they know what they're doing in a particular area. If you want something done a particular way, if somebody has experience in a similar field, 
they think that will apply everywhere they go. And it doesn't necessarily. For David, it was like guerrilla warfare, wasn't it? It was. Whereas an army wouldn't have been any use to him, men that were always stood the attention and went in rows or whatever. So he was able to train them for the particular purpose that he had in mind. He was also able to evaluate them. You see, when uh, people have been trained in an army, they will be guarded as to what they show and what they don't show. These men were at the worst possible scenario. David would have been able to quickly identify those, ah, that person has the potential to be a leader. Ah, that person over there, their skill lies here because you see the raw skill was going to be there and he could build up on the raw skill. There's a lot of advantages if you see it from a different mindset. These pit men were also going to be dependent on them. They're likely to be faithful and grateful because David was putting them out of a hole. Because as we look at this, what has God got for his army? Mm. A motley crew like ever you did see. <laughs> Isn't that right? Because what he has gathered together for his army is exactly that. Mm. And his own words were, what did he say? About a rich man? Mm. I'm going for a camel to get to the eye of the needle. So you see, there's a lot of things that are in here. God is just proving his worth, what he can do with somebody who's got a willing heart. Yeah. Willing, humbling themselves, being grateful. Mm -hmm. It's all about attitude, it's not about what yeah. you have before you. God does not call the equipped, mm -hmm. he equips the called. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened there, he equips the called. These people, would have become very faithful and loyal to David as they went through that journey. But you also notice that later on in 2 Samuel 23, 2 Samuel chapter 23, uh, now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse uh, said, and the, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord speak to me. And his word was in my tongue. Verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. And it starts to go into all of the different names right the way down until uh, verse uh, 39. And you're at 30 and 7 in all. So they actually go through the mighty men of David. David's mighty men that he raised up. I mean, that's, it's pretty awesome that, in actual fact, uh, ultimately David ended up with 37 that he could call, like, right hand, right hand man, out of the whole thing. How important is it when we're choosing those that we're going to stand and, and work together with, if we bring it back to the here and now and ministry? How important is it? how we choose those that are beside us. Very important. It can be the, the downfall of your ministry, or it can be the stability of your ministry. Mm -hmm. See, that, that's one of the things, see everything that you have said. I've actually used terms like that about you when I was talking <coughs> about you. What, 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 what about? about how when you choose who's beside you, some of the traits that are essential in the people. You see, it's only when they're, they're alongside you mm -hmm. that you know whether you can trust them, whether they're reliable. I mean, what, what would be the traits that we would be looking for in somebody coming in alongside us in ministry? Honesty. Yeah. Uh, Consistency. Consistency, yep. Commitment, yep. And the prayer comments. Yep. Their integrity. Mm -hmm. I made a short list of a few things like that. 
the half of a ball slightly overweight. <laughs> oh, that's you, I can. After those calls, can the cat get him on his pregnant? So, the first thing single unified a single unified vision. Are you all on the same page, or is somebody bringing separation into the equation? Are they um, bringing disunity? <coughs> telling you, you need to do it this way. You need to do this, you need to do that. There need to be a single unified vision, integrity. They need to be loyal, reliable. Trustworthy. Trustworthy, very good. Steadfast. They need to have a teachable spirit. If they're so arrogant and determined as to have their own way, then they're not going to be much use to you because they're, if you're supposed to have that one uh, unified vision, then a person that hasn't got a teachable spirit, they will just stubbornly dig their heels in and be determined to have their something way. done their way, to have it done their way because that's what they've decided is right mm -hmm. and that's what you need to do. And I mean, you actually hear that with people. Um, they need to just do such and such. I mean, you hear people talking about other ministers and if that was me, if I was doing that, I would do such and such. But if you're sitting doing nothing except criticizing somebody who is doing something, then you're not being very helpful to the body of Christ at all. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is that God chose that other person to do that particular job. So our job isn't to criticize them, our job is to support them, to support them to into their ministry. Mm -hmm. That's action, really. That's action. Mm -hmm. It's action, but it's it's a supportive action because the other person who's criticizing is ta usually taking some form of action, but it's normally of a critical spirit, and it's not actually going to progress or advance the kingdom. And they need to have a servant heart. They need to be working together uh, with a servant heart towards the same vision. The four things also required to be an effective army. There, there's probably a lot more than these, I just wrote these four things down because I became new. What four things are required to be an effective army? Er, what, what is required to be an effective army? What do you need in place? What things? You need trustworthy for start. Yep. Command structure. Command structure, yes. <coughs> Team, teamwork. No, the command structure should have been in there. Um, organization was the, the word, but command yes. structure is much better. Discipline. Yes. Discipline. But indeed, you need a command structure, which is exactly what we were talking about last week in the, the armor. Commitment, unified cause. The army needs obedience, obedience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these six things we need. <laughs> Unified cause and a command structure. Mm -hmm. Number two, commitment, organization, discipline, discipline. and obedience. It kind of comes under discipline, but it's, it is actually slightly di different because you can be disciplined without being obedient. So you can. They should go together. They don't always. Okay, so David's life was not an easy ride. Far from it. His training ground was in the people that he had to work with were reprobates to begin with, and yet he managed to build up an effective army from what he was given. He managed to rule as king, and he managed to discipline and structure his life in the most adverse conditions. He kept his integrity. Because every time that Saul came into his grasp, where the test was to see whether or not David would take advantage and um, basically slay him. Because at the end of the day, who would have blamed him for killing Saul? There's not a person reading the Bible who wouldn't have thought that he had just cause. And yet he constantly made that declaration, that's not the Lord's anointed. And so we see that this man, indeed, whilst his integrity was lacking in the family unit, 
his integrity towards God seemed to have been pretty much up there. You can't say perfect because there's there's so much about David that's so negative that um, but you can see that his heart was always to refocus, refocus, refocus and back up to I was thinking of Jesus' words to the enemy, what's not to go to God's anointed? Not us. That's right, that is us. Mm-hmm. Which takes us very neatly into the next bit, which is where we're, we're going to finish on this passage and look at um, at what took place. We're turning to Acts 27, because all of the scriptures for our learning, we're going to read through Acts 27. Obviously, this is Paul. Uh, Paul journey um, to Rome. And when it was determined that we should sail unto Italy, they delivered um, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus band. And entering into a ship of Adramitrium, perhaps, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, when Aristarchus, a Macedonian, of Thessalonica being with us. The next day we touched at Sidon and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. When we launched from thence we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So here's the first thing that we see that comes against Paul because what we're going to see is basically a, a week or a fortnight and so in the life of Paul. Not a day because it was much, much longer on this time. But we've got to also remember that <coughs> as we read through the whole of the New Testament, this is not an isolated instance of persecution. This is a piece of persecution sandwiched between two other pieces of persecution, sandwiched between two other pieces of persecution because. Paul's whole life was being was under persecution. The enemy was constantly chasing after Paul, both the spiritual and he had obviously his uh, those in the natural that that the enemy had working on his behalf. When they sailed over the sea of Cilia and Pamphylia, we came to uh, <coughs> Myra, a city of uh, Lycia. And there was a centurion found a ship of Alexander sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. When we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Midas. It's, it's even worse now about the split and the hyphen. Midas. The winds were suffering, were not suffering us. We sailed under Crete over against uh, Salmone. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which was called the Fair Heavens. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lucia. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the landing of the lady in the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to um, Phoenicia and their, to winter, which is a, a haven of Crete, and land toward the southwest and northwest. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, losing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose again. Still a tempestuous wind that called your climbing. Your climbing. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up onto the wind, we let her drive. And running onto the certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat, which when we had taken up, they used helps and un, unregarding, unregarding the ship. And fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, uh, straight sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lighted the ship. The third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was taken away. 
But after long abstinences, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained the harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. And there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. I be we must be cast upon a certain island. As we read on through of that, we know that um, that Paul, that the, the ship was lost, indeed, in the in the waters. Um, when we go down to verse 27, and we were in all the ships, 203 score and 16 souls, and when they had eaten enough and had lighted the ship, lightened the ship and cast out the wheat under the sea, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore. Um, and we, we look at, there's trials and tribulations. They have to lighten the load and lighten the load and lighten the load. At one point it tells us that they hadn't eaten for 14 days. And Paul says, you, you need to eat something. You need to eat something for to have some strength. And so we, we read on to that, <coughs> verse 41, Falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck fast, and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves, and the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they should swim, should cast themselves first into the sea, and get to land. And the rest, some on the boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. First one of chapter 28. And when they were escaped and they saw that the island was called Militia, and there was barbarous people and showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when they should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while, they saw no harm came to him. They changed their mind and said, Oh, he is a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honoured us with many honours. And when we departed, they laden us with such things as were necessary. And after three months, we departed in the ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Now, that's a very, very interesting uh, story. As we look, there was prisoners and all sorts on the, on the ship that they were sailing in. They were warned not to travel in those conditions. But look at those, that situation. They got on, they went across. They're traveling from country to country in the sea. Not the way we travel today in large ships. This ship was probably very full with 200 and odd people on it. It probably wasn't with lots of nice space and tables and chairs for to eat off and everything else the way we would have it today. So the conditions were bad. If you're any way queasy at all in the sea, but I think as we look at that, how weary must Paul have been? He gave a message which wasn't received. Graciously, God said, Well, all right, you are going to lose your ship, but I'll, I'll save you all. But remember, Paul actually had to say, Because we're all going to jump ship, and he says, If you don't stay on the ship, you will, you will die. You have to stay here with me because God has assured my safe travel. What are the lessons that we can see from all of <coughs> that we've read there? For start, Paul wasn't saved by the left shore. Yeah. 
Why, why not? Why do you think that? Well, I believe we've got a plan there too, but I believe the enemy had a plan to try and take him out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As soon as you set about a mission of God to accomplish a mission that God has set you, the enemy also mm -hmm. enters into his mission to stop you. You're a target then, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You instantly become a target and he immediately comes. Satan comes immediately to steal away the word. But as soon as you enter and engage into that mission, then he will set his plans in action as well. Mm -hmm. So the sea was contrary and then it got worse and the storm got worse and the storm got worse until they were out at sea and there's nowhere to turn. So it started throwing everything overboard and more things overboard and more things. I think it would have made some sense to have eaten some of the problem and throw it overboard. Yeah. You know, but yeah. even the things that they needed that was necessary to keep the ship going had to be thrown overboard. As if that wasn't bad enough, you would think that once they had reached the stage where they were shipwrecked, that Satan would have quit it. You would have thought so, wouldn't you? Mm. That that was the point. Once they're shipwrecked, well, that's me done. I've succeeded. But do you remember what we were talking about? About the enemy coming in and always going in for the kill until that mission was accomplished. That demonic power did not move on. Well, you look at it, the mission was not accomplished because they all made it to shore. They're not sailing, but they made it to shore. They're under, that says barbarians were there to greet them. They actually shouldn't have been very well received by barbarians yeah. to begin with. And yet, it actually says because the weather was so bad when they arrived with the rain and the cold. So it must have been something like out there. We've come out of the sea. Can you imagine coming out of the sea and standing in that? It actually doesn't bear thinking about sure it doesn't. So as if things weren't bad enough, this is how they found themselves when they got off the, 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 the bits of shipwrecked boat that they were they were on. They went out into the sea. They went out into the place. And then they thought, right, okay, we need to get warmed up. We seriously need to get warmed up. Go and get some sticks. But when you look at that point, you would think that by that stage, if anybody's going to quit, they're going to quit now. And yet, here we find that he then is attacked by a snake, bitten by a snake. I mean, that is a seriously bad day, and a seriously bad finish to a seriously bad month. But he was bitten by that, and so they all turned on him and says, he must be one of those murderers. He must be one of, you know, that's who he is. He's not who he says he is at all. And then when he didn't die, then they elevated him and said he was a god. I mean, the, you know, he was under persecution. He was under um, ridicule. He was under condemnation. Everything was, all the pressure was on him. And yet he was able to, to stay firm. And then, because he stayed firm right the way through to the end, because even that snake, he just shook it off. Mm -hmm. After that, they then brought all their sick to be healed. So he got his breakthrough. Mm -hmm. But see at the end where it says that he, he then, they stayed there and then they gave all of them under them gifts. <coughs> and then they sailed um, on the ship to Alexandria. That, would have been a wealthy man's journey. So he was given absolute total faith after he weathered the storm in isolation and then got the word from God and says, Look, did I not say you were going to go before Caesar? And he reminded him of the purpose of which he had set out to do and told him that he was going to, to go there. I think it's pretty amazing because I virtually could have opened any page of the New Testament and told you except the Gospels properly but for the most part I could have opened the New Testament and either read you a letter that he'd written from prison, mm -hmm. a shipwreck, a beaten, you know you can go through any number of things because each one of his tribulations came because of the testimony of the Gospel. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Not because of doing something. And when we looked at the people, I mean, Joseph hadn't done anything wrong for the deserve. Moses did. Moses murdered somebody. Uh, so he did actually instigate that one problem. Uh, but we know that David, on that case with Saul, hadn't done anything wrong. And here we have Paul, who also hadn't done anything wrong. And so this persecution doesn't come because we're doing something wrong. Persecution comes for the gospel's sake. Mm -hmm. And when people in the, who are in churches say, I'm being persecuted, normally it's more because of the lifestyle that they're living than because they're actually being persecuted for the gospel's sake. Not in every case, but very often that we will see that they will use that umbrella to cover things that are going on. But you actually find that persecution comes whenever you try to take the gospel mm -hmm. of the kingdom. And it's the gospel of the kingdom. See, it actually doesn't really care if you take wrong doctrine. You go out teaching people God doesn't heal, so, you know, we don't, we don't need to try. Satan will probably leave you alone because he's fine with that. Because you're not going to demonstrate the kingdom that way. It's when you actually go out to activate the power of God and fully preach the gospel, because that's what Paul said. By this, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and demonstrating the kingdom, that, by that, I have fully preached the gospel. Whenever we are involved in leading and going forward, it's our example that sets the standard. It will quickly become evident and people will gain confidence in us. It is whenever we are under attack, what are we communicating? Victory or defeat? What we communicate when we're under attack actually is what um, it reveals our strength or, or our weakness, depending on which one you're communicating. When somebody, when they're under attack, if they're being very negative, you're not going to follow them because you don't want to fall into the same pit that they clearly have fallen into. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we see with Paul, that when they were in the midst and they were all going to jump overboard, he actually stood up and says, no, 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 don't do that. Look, this is the way that it's going to be. And so long as you stay in the ship, I have been told that my purpose will go. And as long as you stay here with me, you will get to the other side. You will. So don't be doing anything foolish or rash or drastic. And really we need to be of a mindset to, to realise that we do have the victory and that we need to be running to God for the answer. Because he's the only one with the answer. Not, um, not we in and of ourselves. But it is all in our attitude. But even the world know that. I mean, we, we know that even the world know that all the things that we were talking about earlier, our attitude towards everything <coughs> reveals whether or not, you know, you can tell what's in somebody's heart immediately they open their mouth. As soon as they open their mouth with, ah, but you don't understand what I've been through, you think, all right, here we go again. It's all because of this. It's all because of that. So you instantly switch off as soon as somebody goes in. But I do anyway, because... I know that there isn't going to be any talking to them. They're not going to be teachable, they're not going to be reasonable, and they actually are quite happy being the victim, the victim mentality. And they're, they will use every excuse under the sun, and they will blame everybody under the sun. I mean, those that didn't, that couldn't blame their upbringing, or couldn't blame their school, couldn't blame their teacher, they blamed their great-grandparents, who, if they hadn't done something before they were ever born, then they wouldn't have been in the mess that they're in. We make our own life. We make our own life and we make our own destiny. David here we saw was not in a position to, to create a fruitful and productive destiny if you were looking at it from natural circumstances. That is the warrior side of David. How he, how he lives. It actually covers the leadership aspect of David as well. It covers how how he built, how he established the leadership qualities on the inside of him. And basically, all of it amounted to the preparation in the secret place. Every bit of David's 
life was all about establishing God on the inside of him. Which is for us too, because David had established before he ever went before Goliath. Mm -hmm. He just had to keep refocusing to come back to it. I'm not sure what we're covering next week. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the text and if there's some reading that we'll read up on it. Hmm? We won't be here next week, that's right. We won't be here next week. <laughs> we will be in Twain ourselves in Harvey's Point. So we will. Um, Do you want us to come there and meet you there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you would be delighted if you did. It is absolutely so 